everybody. And this is going to be a presentation that we hope you're going to find useful. Its aim is for parents and what parents need to know about diets, eating disorders, and more. Uh, this presentation doesn't replace a personalized um, advice. So please uh, use this as general uh, information, general uh, knowledge to guide you and to guide you towards uh, getting the, the right support later on. Uh, it's part of MIDA's raising awareness activities. So the two presenters today will be myself and Dr. Jumana Wardi Kamar, who is uh, with me right now on the screen. And this is a little bit about us there. Today, we are going to be going through the following subjects. Of course, we could be spending a lot of time on these topics, but we're going to keep them as uh, short, but as concise and as helpful as possible. And of course, if there's any comments or any questions, you can always get in touch with us and we will be sharing with you all this information at the end of this presentation. So what is eating? Obviously, this is something that we do without thinking much about it. And these are essential questions. So we're just going to quickly go through these. So food is fuel. It's a, just a little bit like the, if we're going to use the analogy of a car, like the car functions because it's got an engine. And inside this engine, there's many different aspects to it. And it's really important to know how that functions. And the physical body um, functions in the same way. And we have hunger cues, hormones that informs us of it is time to eat. And then we have satiety cues, which informs us that we are full. So the idea is about listening, learning to listen to our, our bodies cues. So eating to live as opposed to living to eat. Learning about our hunger signals. This is about the feelings and the sensations in the body that usually inform us that, oh, I'm a little bit, I'm hungry now. I'd like to eat. And we would like to pay attention to, to these signals. Sometimes we kind of dismiss them. And when we do, we begin to experience different symptoms. Usually these sensations of hunger are going to come when we're feeling a lack of energy and maybe fatigue. And there's going to be these different hormones that are released in the body. There's many different types to signal that it is time for us to refuel. So a few of the signals and symptoms will be like stomach rumbling, um, having uh, poor concentration, maybe being a little bit irritable. And that usually is a signal for us that it's time to eat. There's something we call regular eating, which is a key thing. And just like the engine of a car that needs fuel, every certain, um, at a certain uh, millage or um, certain distance, it needs to be recharged with petrol and the uh, physical body functions in the same way. We know that every two, three to four hours, if we, um, that our body will need uh, some food. And usually an advice is to have about five meals a day, but here uh, these five meals are divided into three meals and up to two snacks every day. And if the body is uh, regularly fed this way, nourished this way, then our day um, flows much more smoothly. It's really important that the a physical body is nourished with a variety of food groups. And simply similarly to a car, 
It has different aspects like the oil, not just the petrol, it also have some water. There are so many different aspects to it. And if we just um, stop giving the engine all the different elements of what it needs, then the car will stop working or functioning properly. And you will get then get a light indicator in, um, in the front of the, the driver's seat that's going to come on, indicating that there's something that we need to check. So it's important that a physical body gets all the different foods from different food groups. And this is um, an image that um, we are sharing here from the Harvard School of Public Health. And basically, this is just basically to show how different food groups are really important and they have balance of meals. This is what's important. The word, the key word here is balance. A balance means um, giving the body all the different nutrients that it needs in order to function properly. So again, this is another image that we should be sharing directly from the Harvard University, um, which they call healthy eating. But I'd like to just to highlight here that um, maybe it's something that we would rather use as a, as a better word, but, or a more appropriate word, let's say, is about balance or optimal, like an optimal, what would we would find on a, on a plate that would be more balanced. So having these different food groups um, on each plate or on every meal that you have, a combination of these different groups. So balance would probably be a word that uh, at least we feel that Nida would be more appropriate to be uh, using. So, Jumana. Yes, uh, am I able uh, to go? Yes, of course. Put on the slides? Okay. So I did not try yet. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about body weight. Uh, so what is body weight? No, I cannot. Uh, so I will, I will guide you through the process. Okay. Yeah. So what is body weight? The body weight is definitely the weight of our body. So we measure it on the scale in pounds or, or kilograms. And uh, body weight is uh, something that we inherit from our parents, from our families just like the color of our hair, the color of our eyes, or uh, our shoe size. So uh, body weight, we cannot change much in it. And uh, what we need to know is that we need to work on having the most optimal body weight within our type of body weight. So some parents have, uh, are overweight because this is what they inherited and 50% uh, of, we have 50% chance of having a higher body weight just like our parents or our tall just like our parents. So these are some things that we cannot change. They are genetically set. Uh, what we need to be is the healthiest or the most optimal in our body type. Next. Uh, and we often uh, talk about the genetic set point. This is what I was explaining, that it's uh, um, the predisposition of having a certain body weight once we are at the adult age, uh, a certain body weight that we usually uh, inherit and uh, are predisposed with genetically. Next. So why do we put on weight? Uh, first and logically, it's because we grow. While growing, kids, then adolescents and adults start putting on weight because the, uh, all the elements of our bodies and the organs are growing and weigh heavier. Uh, the, the second reason is just like I was talking about this predisposition to store more than other kids. And it's often uh, people feel it's really unfair. Like why do my friend eat so much uh, fun foods and chocolates and desserts and do not put as much weight as me while I only ate one small piece of dessert. And this is the genetic 
and the, the genetic predisposition that we had of uh, having this tendency to store more. And these are our family genes. Um, of course, uh, whoever is uh, concerned with uh, body weight will see that we often put more weight when we um, spend less energy. So energy imbalance is also responsible of uh, putting on fat and storing fat when we eat more than what our body needs or when we are more like we see in young and adolescents today staying more indoors playing on their uh, tv and computer games instead of running outside so the energy imbalance is one of the responsible of putting on weight and of course some medications for certain diseases have uh, put the person at a um, higher chance of storing diseases some diseases uh, related to uh, diabetes to diabetes to uh, thyroid uh, or cortisol or insulin metabolic syndromes put the patients at a higher predisposition of storing and putting on weight and the uh, diets and we will see how diets are one of the triggers of uh, the yo-yo and um, uh, difficulty at uh, keeping a weight that is stable or controlled so weight control is the, the base of weight control is a balance. It's uh, the bodies genetically and naturally will regulate around the genetic set point that we talked about earlier. So without dieting or uh, overeating or over ex exercising, the weight will stabilize around this genetic set point. The most important thing is to have a balanced meal and a lifestyle that is active, of course, but not overactive uh, also. And next, so diets and the dangers maybe. Um, so I, will, I, will take, I will take on, on this. So diets and the dangers, thank you, Jumana. So the diets and the dangers. Um, of course, here there's uh, so many different um, diets um that are out there that uh, are have been available for for many people um many of which uh, um, may be uh, effective uh, for some people but also can be very dangerous for many other people especially when they're not uh, supervised and uh, jumana if you'd like to say something quickly also about this that would be great yeah these are all the different diets and there are zillion more i think uh, if you go online and start looking at books and uh, doctors and dietitians they all advise for the best diet the latest uh, um, uh, science about uh, dieting and this is the best one this is the one that will finally uh, make you lose weight and uh, stabilize unfortunately most of them if not all are absolutely uh, false because they are based on restricting either restricting many uh, um, yes. components or nutrients mm. or uh, starving or over exercising or when uh, uh, yeah. you know uh, there are also the vegan diets etc so yes. restriction is really the worst thing Yes. Uh, and diets, about diets. And, and just like Jumana was saying here, of course, uh, every diet means restricting food. Uh, it, it means restricting in quantity or restricting in, in, in the quality. And uh, so this actually can create a lot of um, um, imbalance and uh, can be misguiding and uh, can also be very dangerous um when this is carried out um by oneself without the supervision of a of a qualified professional 
in this decision making. And we see, meet uh, so many different people um, who uh, in this line of work, but not only in, 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 our, in our clinical uh, work, but also just people in our social life. We've heard time and time again, lots of people who say, have you tried this diet? I'm on this diet right now. Most of the time, people who maybe read about it or they've seen other people who've been doing it or, or they see this new thing that's being promoted. And so people are doing it blindly uh, without any guidance. And that really puts them in a dangerous um, health spot. The effects of diets produce hunger. Now, this is a little uh, sketch here um, that basically depicts a little bit what, what happens in, in, the, in, in, the, in some discussions uh, between, uh, between people. It just gives an idea here of really the level of conversation that people are, ha are having. Sometimes, this is just one example, um, and uh, also this this here is is a um, is a discussion that happens in English, but it's also a, a, a kind of discussions that happen in the the Middle East, uh, and of course it has a little different 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 connotation also in in in, uh, in the Arab world. Um, Jumana, you'd like to maybe mention something here with respect to these conversations that uh, that we saw uh, often it's, here. Uh, the basic of diet is the restriction, essentially first in quantity, uh, but also like uh, I said about uh, removing and restricting uh, all sorts of food groups, huge uh, food groups. So here. Uh, the girl is asking the boy, so what do you do, uh, what do you eat when you're on a diet? And then the kid answers a, an egg for breakfast and an apple for lunch. So this is obviously very, very little, but this is unfortunately what people do. They restrict so much, they end up at the end of the day getting very, very hungry. And this is one of the first yeah. side effects mm -hmm. and a downfall, but also like it backfires um, at the end of the day and you see that and when she asked him what do you do for dinner and then he answered half of the fridge so of course uh, we cannot tolerate uh, hunger on the long run and it definitely will backfire yes yes so here are the effects of diets basically when we're depriving ourselves of food what's a normal uh, response uh, physiologically will be cravings uh, simply because the 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 the, the body, the physical body, uh, feels that there's something that's that's uh, being uh, deficient and needs to uh, needs to respond to that. So it, it creates cravings that can be very very powerful. And uh, it uh, obviously here uh, we start thinking about food much more often than necessary as a result of these uh, the cravings as a result of not um, as a as a, re a result of the restriction. That, that we are creating. And restriction is important to mention that restriction can be, um, it's relative to each person. Somebody is restricting a little bit, somebody is restricting a lot. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's going to create cravings in the physical body. That means there's going to be a whole reaction that's going to happen afterwards. Any food that is forbidden is then craved for. So it creates this famine or feast type of response. What we crave, we then want to have more of, as opposed to the opposite. Now, why diets uh, don't work, especially when they're not personalized and suitable, that means it's not something that's being followed specifically for your type of condition that you're actually suffering from, but uh, why they don't work is because exactly what, what you just said, it just creates this restriction, the cravings, the famine and feast. Uh, you might uh, lose uh, a weight, uh, maybe too fast, especially on strict forms of diets. You, at the same time, you lose muscle mass. Um, then the body adapts by decreasing your metabolism as a response to survive. You need less food to maintain your weight. Um, but at the same time, there's not one person who follows the same diet all their life. Not one person that at least in my clinical experience, and I'm sure I might be speaking to many other people uh, uh, as well. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Jumana, on this uh, topic, that no one can diet all their lives following a same diet. Not only the same, but dieting uh, all their lives, they will always be craving, restricting some food groups or some or a lot of in quantity, and it will backfire in hunger and craving. So yes. they will go back to even if they go back to regular eating, regular means lower quantities. It will always be more 
than mm -hmm. the uh, metabolic or uh, body yes. needs. Of course, and the reason for that is that yes, for the the reason for that is that basically what happens is that when the body was in a restricting mode, then the 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 body is going to start to understand that uh, as a survival mechanism, the next time you're going to start oh. eating, it wants to protect itself. And so what happens is that your metabolism goes down and you start storing food the next time you start eating and let's say you start eating normally. And in the end, your body starts stocking the food. We need to think about the body as a, it's got an intelligence of itself, an intelligence that's separate from that of your mind and what you think is what you'd like to do for other reasons. You know, and this is when basically you start gaining weight because the physical body is protecting itself in that sense. But by protecting itself, it's probably adapting in a maladapted type of way. So overall, you end up having more complications. The storing machine. Yes. And this is where we begin to enter into the into, into this um, the illness of eating disorders that becomes very problematic. You, know, you develop an obsessional relationship. You become, uh, you develop uh, an emotional relationship with food that actually sets the stage for something that becomes far worse as we uh, uh, as we progress. So, and how do diets trigger eating disorders? Simply because it's passing on uh, a message that is distorted, misunderstood, and and faulty. Um, it's too general, and it doesn't. It's not suitable for uh, for 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 everyone. So, some people will do anything not to gain weight, and there's many reasons for that, which we will discuss. Uh, very uh, quickly in, in this uh, presentation, but the fact of exercising, restricting food, and using other dangerous ineffective methods, whether it's using laxatives or diuretics or supplements or things like that to maintain a certain weight or to reduce a certain weight has all kinds of different side effects after that. And then after that point, one feels that we can always have control, but in fact, we begin to lose control um, of the behavior and of the intake. So what do these trigger in the long run? Two vicious cycles, the restriction of the eating, basically you're um, entering into um, a, a situation where you are starving yourself during the day, you're saving up uh, uh, calories for an expected perhaps evening binge because your body uh, needs food at the end, maybe you eat, then you compensate for calories previously uh, ingested, by, uh, uh, in, uh, again, uh, uh, moving into this cycle, which then basically perpetuates in an addictive cycle where you're feeling deprived, there's emotions that begin to kick in, and uh, that makes you eat uh, more, you enter into a dangerous cycle. And that's two, two very specific uh, mechanisms that's, that, that are set, set in, um, uh, in motion. Um, and leads us to the development of an eating disorder. So, Jumana, would you like to? So, we we get to eating disorders. Definitely, not all patients will, uh, not all patients or not all people who go on a diet will end up having an eating disorder. It's one of the worst and most important side effects of a diet. Uh, next, and eating disorder is about, there are many in, in, uh, that are recognized. Uh, we will speak mainly about uh, two or three that are the most famous and uh, that are uh, anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating. So uh, eating disorders is when a diet or a person becomes obsessed with food, whether eating because of hunger or whether restricting because they're afraid of putting on weight. So it's this obsessive uh, and constant uh, thinking about food, shape and weight that qualifies what is an eating disorders. Anorexia nervosa is one of the very severe uh, eating disorders Patients restrict a lot of food, they are afraid of food, and they are constantly postponing uh, meal times and uh, checking their bodies, going on the scale, uh, obsessed with thinness, 
And when they look at their uh, body weight in the mirror, they imagine themselves uh, fatter than they are. And this is the distorted by the image that comes with uh, um, uh, the disease. And uh, so they are ready to do anything to keep the weight off after they have lost weight and they're unable to control their hunger, their satiety, and uh, their exercise. They, they, it's just, it just becomes an obsession and they cannot go uh, out of it. Uh, another uh, type of eating disorder is bulimia. Bulimia could be a consequence or a complication of anorexia. And it also happens in patients and people who are obsessed with thinness and body weight and shape. So they starve themselves, but just like cravings and hunger at the end of the day, they're just unable to tolerate more hunger and uh, they binge uh, in, in huge quantities without even being able to control this, these intakes. And at the end of their meal, they feel uh, ashamed, they feel full, and uh, they go uh, and purge whatever they ate because of the guilt of having eaten so much and putting on weight. So, and this will bring us back to that cycle of uh, self, low self-esteem because of the purging, because of having overeaten and because of not being able to control themselves in front of food and keep their uh, body weight stable. So it's a terrible disease that is also very dangerous. We need to know that anorexia nervosa is uh, a killer, all of them actually are a killer. And in psychiatric uh, diseases, among the psychiatric diseases, because eating disorder is qualified as a psychiatric disease, um, the eating disorder is the deadliest of all psychiatric diseases. So I will go right before uh, Jeremy just to mention binge eating disorders. It's the third uh, eating uh, disorder that we're gonna mention today, but it's one of the most common also. It's as uh, in, in percentage, is, it's as common than uh, bulimia and anorexia together. So uh, here we have less um, obsession with food and weight and people it's a bad uh, maladaptation, maladaptive coping system with uh, emotion, usually negative emotion, that people will go and turn to food to compensate and to cope and to so soothe their negative feelings. And this will also take them in this uh, regret, shame, and guilt cycle of eating a lot, not being able uh, to uh, soothe themselves uh, in a different way. So uh, people who have binge eating disorders usually do not purge. And because they do not purge, they usually have a normal or more or less heavier body weight. So here, these are a few of the statistics, which, uh, yeah. well, I mean, you can uh, read them here a little bit on the screen so that we can just uh, move through, not take too much time on this, um, this talk. Um, then we also have certain warning signs of eating disorders. Uh, there are physical warning signs that as parents you can um, uh, observe. Um, and it's important that when you do observe them that uh, you seek the, um, the, the uh, help or the counseling oh, yeah. of an eating disorder specialist uh, but usually typical signs would be like sudden weight loss or it might be uh, suddenly an over preoccupation on body uh, body shape and uh, maybe it might be kind of critical they, you might notice that they're tired all the time maybe withdrawn maybe not wanting to sit around the table you might have sleep disturbances uh, you might also notice uh, uh, changes in the menstrual cycles happens to be um, a girl, 
um, and uh, there might also be regular body checking or continuously making comments about their own body shape or size and comparing themselves a lot or you might be changing clothes frequently. Uh, other behaviors might be like skipping meals or cooking for others, counting calories or um, replacing fluids here with chewing gums uh, or just pretending not to be hungry, uh, avoiding uh, outings uh, around meals or meal times. And even, even in some cases, like cutting foods into, into groups, there's many different changes. So these are kind of signs that you'll, you'll see. They might be exercising a little bit more than, uh, than usual as well. Again, sometimes um, we, we, what we want to, to, to share, say here is that's really important is that, of course, you will be observing certain uh, very specific changes, but we don't want to be alarm, alarming parents uh, as well, just to become very observant on any kind of change that happens. It doesn't mean that um, your child is, has, a, has an eating disorder uh, automatically, you know, if there's these certain behaviors that are presented. So, but it's important to get the right advice, right counseling, if you do observe certain changes at that level. And uh, sometimes with a healthcare uh, a, a specialist, we'll be able to um, make the proper um, uh, advice uh, for you. Um, and so this is exactly what MIDA does uh, in the Middle East. So we have another type of eating disorder known as uh, avoidant and restricted food intake disorder, which is not commonly known by people, but uh, generally it's a behavior that, uh, that is quite common that we actually see in our children, mostly uh, not liking foods, you know, prefer not wanting to eat or being very picky eaters. Uh, this, it's a form of eating disorder. It's different than, uh, than, than the rest. Uh, perhaps Jumana would like to uh, maybe say a few things. On yeah, that. we need to pay attention to this because uh, parents may uh, confuse it with picky eaters. It usually could begin in kids who were picky eaters, but the amount of food that they would accept and eat is really very restricted. And usually we talk about about 20 uh, types of food groups. So uh, what is uh, different than uh, picky eaters is that uh, kids, mainly kids, but it could happen in adults, are uh, restrictive to a level that it affects their growth. So in picky eaters, you will not see uh, kids losing weight or a stunned growth um, on the chart. Uh, while in uh, ARFID, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, usually uh, the kids are underfed in terms of quality and nutrient uh, um, quality, and they would lose um, body weight and stun their growth. On the other hand, these kids uh, or adolescents or, or food are not like in the typical eating disorder, um, obsessive about their weight or shape. It's only a fear, a pathological fear of trying new, new food. It could be about the texture, it could be about their smell, it could be about their shape. They are completely, uh, they, they could really scream and make a temper and it shows that they are really phobic. Uh, about uh, these kinds of food. And the treatment, just like uh, the other eating disorders, are, uh, should be done by a specialized team of uh, doctor, medical doctor, dietitian, and psychologist to uh, reassess and uh, reconcile in a term the child with different new foods. I'm talking about ARFID but all the other eating disorder treatments are to be um, dealt with specifically with a team specialized in eating disorders. Not any medical doctor or psychologist or nutritionist knows uh, uh, all the differences and all the uh, psychological behavior and uh, difficulties of uh, an eating disorder, someone suffering from an eating disorder. Yes, absolutely. So next, next we're gonna be talking about body image, which is a really important part, uh, the way that we actually uh, see ourselves. So what is body image? Because of course we all uh, 
think about how we look like. This is like an intrinsic uh, part of uh, human behavior to look at each other and to assess how we are. And, and, and that really has an impact um, in many respects. So what is it? It really starts early on in our life. Um, it's um, about uh, how we uh, think, about how we feel, about how we act towards one's body, um, how we assess uh, uh, attractiveness uh, as a way to have attention or get attention as well. Uh, it starts early on uh, in our initial relationship with our parents as well, or in that initial contacts that we have. So that's going to really shape how we how we view ourselves and uh, also lead to uh, whether we're satisfied or dissatisfied. Uh, that means have negative feelings towards our bodies or not regarding our weights and size. And that will, will, will come because of perhaps uh, comments that are made to us or behaviors that are made to us. If parents are being attentive or not and encouraging or holding us or not, there are so many different elements that, are, that come into play. So how does um, one's body image impact it impacts our self-esteem, our sense of self-love, our confidence. And of course, if we have low self-esteem, that's often associated with anxiety, with depression, and that's one of the uh, common um, issues that we uh, often see in, in, in eating disorders. So uh, being able to build a good and uh, positive body image is a critical aspect of children's development as they start uh, as, 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 as little as uh, age of um, three. Of course, that all the, the parenting and the caring and the approach we have is going to be so, so essential. Uh, the most vulnerable time and transition in our life is adolescence, when the body changes quite dramatically, fast, you know, uh, going from, you know, being a child to entering into the uh, state of being an adult. And that can be so confronting. Actually, it's a difficult phase for for everyone. Some of us, it's smooth, more smoother than for others, but it's all kind of a transition. And for people uh, during that time in which they, they go through a, a much more difficult uh, uh, transition can also be a, a fragile and vulnerable time for developing uh, you know, an eating disorder. So your body image is stored in your brain cells, not in your fat cells. This is um, uh, a quote. Uh, by a body image uh, therapist, which is really important. This is one of the things we will really want to be keeping in mind. You know? um, here, there was a study done at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, Jumana, maybe you'd like to say a little bit more about this. Uh, that showed that uh, mothers' concerns uh, about their own body weights affect a lot the body image and the acceptance and the self-esteem, the self body love of their kids so when a mom is always looking at her shape saying she's stating that she's on a diet oh i don't like my uh, my thighs i have uh, big feet or i feel fat all these will trigger the attention of the children to their own bodies and they will start scrutinizing their 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 own bodies and uh, uh, feeling bad bad about it uh, so this is really very important. It was scientifically proved that it's not only about talking to the person herself or the, to the child about his own body weight, but it's parents who are a role model and that will trigger the attention of the children. So we need to really pay attention to this. Another caution to be uh, in the same uh, you know, line uh, parents or adults around uh, children or adolescents who constantly watch uh, and um, talk about their own uh, struggles with uh, body weight, with fat. I'm skipping dinner today. I'm not going to eat fat anymore. I'm not eating breakfast anymore because I was told that this new intermittent fasting is very uh, effective on body weight. Uh, I can't tolerate my body anymore. I feel so fat. I hate myself, etc. So all these self um, talk about uh, uh, in parents should be uh, really avoided in front yes. of children. Yes, absolutely. 
So here we go to another very important subject. It's about social pressure and body image, uh, body shaming. Um, again, uh, this is can have a, you know a, you know big huge impact on one's development. Uh, so social pressures includes what we see in the media, um, online, um, usually uh, all kind of um, images we see in the in, in, in magazines or on TV. It really shapes the way that we uh, we think of ourselves and uh, our idea of. Uh, beauty and even our uh, idea of what a perfect uh, person uh, or person or even body where we, we have to be so how we must appear and so there's many different um, aspects of uh, social pressure that uh, will simply encourage a type of behavior that will then turn into being maladaptive that can lead into development and the sustain, sustaining the, the behavior of eating disorders. So um, uh, the messages that we can often see uh, around us, which we have to be really mindful of is um, the idea and the concept of being thin and you will be happy. Uh, this is really, really, uh, a wrong message to be uh, spreading and, and creates uh, uh, dangerous um, outcomes. Um, All the billboards and ads that uh, stress uh, the relationship between happiness, beauty, and thinness are really uh, to be to be. Yes, and a lot of the time, the what 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 happens at home and the comments uh, that we make to our own kids then uh, other kids will begin to make the same comments to other kids in schools. And then we have different forms of bullying or weight stigmatizing. And we have to be really careful because the way that we speak to our kids at home is also going to impact the way that our kids or other kids and explains why other kids are going to be speaking the same way. So we are role models in that sense. Um, or even commenting to our kids who are eating in a particular way and suddenly parents become very concerned, very reactive, very scared. Uh, maybe because it's something that they've had to deal, deal with when they were uh, younger as well. So we need to, to really be careful with what, what we say there. We need to understand that beauty is something that, uh, that um, moves through the ages. Uh, what was considered beauty at one period isn't just beauty today. And it's something that we see over and over again throughout, throughout times. That uh, the most important thing that beauty is a perception. It's an idea of an ideal. Uh, so that is really important. Uh, the influences that we have around us in the media, such as toys. I can't hear you uh, anymore, Jeremy. Such as TV, um, car cartoons. Side, I can hear you. I think we can hear you. Maybe your connection is going to be coming back uh, in a bit or shortly. So um, just, uh, uh, just bearing in mind here that... Uh, uh, these are different influences that actually spread a, 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 an image, uh, of course, of what we are meant to attain. Uh, we might also have uh, media manipulation, photoshopping, all of that. That is something that happens uh, time and time again. And uh, this is something that actually can be uh, taking place. So uh, as a result of the different social pressures, uh, there's uh, so many um, uh, studies uh, and surveys out there that really uh, show and highlight the impact that different uh, pressures have as uh, not only as young as, as six years old, it might be even uh, younger, but uh, we can see all kinds of uh, very alarming statistics out there. And we each play a role in this and uh, each can play a role in, in changing this. So we need to be mindful of this. And this is again, one of the roles that NIDA plays in uh, creating this awareness. Uh, we want to uh, really look and pay attention to each of our different uh, social, uh, our different context, our different family. We need to consider uh, our culture uh, and uh, really avoid uh, just going along with whatever society expects 
uh, how a society expects us to appear or what our eating habits should be. But it's more important about getting the right information across. Uh, remember that food is energy, just like a car, it needs to function in a certain way and we need to be mindful of that. But we also need to be mindful that our body, our mind functions in a different way and uh, uh, we have thoughts, we have emotions. That's really uh, important to know how to express them and how to communicate them. So we have to be careful not to, uh, to compare because everybody has, a, has different genes. So we cannot compare, uh, you know, even different feet. We have different shoe sizes. How can someone who, whose natural size, foot size uh, being 38, um, you know, fit into a smaller size or uh, fit into a bigger size or fit into a size 42 or vice versa? So again, we need to, uh, to be aware of, uh, aware of this. Um, here we have in the last section of our um, presentation, our uh, guidelines for parents. Uh, we need to first start to mention that what is important is to lead by example. Like we are the role models here. We want to be uh, mindful of not using food as a reward, which is something that uh, we often hear in the Middle East, but uh, also in many other parts of the world. I'll give you uh, an ice cream if you do this, uh, or I will get you some candies if you do that, or I might get you a donut after you finish your homework. I mean, these are kind of comments that we often hear. We want to be mindful of them. Um, being able as a parent, uh, as, a, as an adult, to be mindful of differentiating between internal, internal cues, meaning the signals of your body when you're hungry and full, and differentiating that with maybe the emotions that you're having at the end of the day. Maybe you've had a, a stressful day at work, and maybe you didn't eat a lot. You might come back home, let's say, and you're feeling very hungry, but you don't noticing your hunger. Maybe you're, you're just being very irritable and angry. We want to be able to, to, to differentiate these and to know when to take a nap, when to, when to relax, when to, when to eat at the right time so that you can be functioning better at work. It's all actually connected this way. Um, allow yourself to express your emotions, um, take your time to eat, not in a rush, slowly and mindfully, like eating around the table um, together, as opposed to in front of the television. Uh, these are little uh, things that are important to encourage physical activity for the right reasons, not because we want to lose weight, because we're having fun is important. We want to refrain from having making comments on physical appearance, even our own physical appearance and our own uh, body issues, because again, these are role. We're leading by example, if we remember. And the more important thing is about teaching about the value of inner qualities, uh, inner beauty, um, inner peace of mind, um, as opposed to uh, connecting how you appear physically as a criteria. Uh, that's, that's, that's really, really important. Uh, so Jumana, if you'd like to mention uh, something yes. here. Uh, no, I just want to, you were talking about uh, internal cues and emotions to avoid uh, the overly uh, expression of emotional eating, which we see usually people would cope and soothe their feelings, their negative emotions with uh, food. So this is something that is common and that could happen from time to time. But if each time uh, the the food or uh, is is used to cope with our own emotions, this would be definitely pathological. So uh, hopefully you will find this presentation uh, beneficial and useful. You need to keep in mind that uh, what we're sharing are general, uh, very general um, and very essential points to know about our relationship with food, in particular eating disorders and complications around this. Uh, we want to highlight that everybody is different and to learn how to accept one's body um, and to accept our imperfections uh, as well. So uh, Mida is here to help people in the Middle East. Uh, these are the different ways um, that we can actually be reached to uh, refer people in the region to get the right support and help. There's still a lot of work to do, to do in the region, but um, this is just part of our mission to keep raising awareness and uh, offer people uh, the right evidence-based approach by seeking the help 
uh, in the right di uh, direction. So hopefully you, you, you found this very helpful, uh, uh, me and Dr. Zumana today. And uh, um, you can uh, uh, definitely seek, uh, seek our advice if, uh, if needed. So thank you. Yeah, the idea is to sensitize uh, and give you a basic information and triggers and pay attention to your children and people around you. And consult whenever you think or see that there's a problem happening. Mm -hmm.